Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, everybody, for coming here. And thank you, first, to all the men and women of Greenwood Cemetery who've helped me out so much over so many years with this project. It's really been fun from the very first day I got involved in it. Jeff doesn't remember, I don't think, the very first time we met because we didn't introduce each other. But I was here with my wife and our friend Deborah Gardner, who's sitting here too, an urban historian, and we were here for the Memorial Day concert in 2000. And at intermission, I was very inspired, and I walked down to the History Historic Fund uh, tent there where they were selling all sorts of things, and I picked up this gorgeous book here that uh, a short man was, uh, was uh, <laughs> selling. I, I think he had a beard on at that time, if I recall, but being characteristically modest, he, uh, he did not uh, introduce himself or tell me that actually he wasn't just taking the money. He actually had written a book, and that was Jeff Richman. And, uh, I brought that book home uh, that night, and I, I literally stayed up all night reading the book. I, I pretty much licked every word off the pages. It's a marvelous book. And one story among the 250 stories of uh, famous, infamous, and unknown permanent residents of this wonderful place stood out and really grabbed my attention just unbelievably, and that's the Burdell Cunningham case. What you're seeing on the uh, screen here, as soon as I readjust it, is an tinted engraving from Frank Leslie's Illustrated from 1857 showing the scene out in front of 31 Bond Street, which is the stoop uh, into which people are entering and exiting uh, early on the morning of February, uh, on, early on the morning of January 31st, uh, t excuse me, early on the morning of January 31st, 2007. Uh, that morning, it's uh, about 7 a.m., uh, Harvey Burdell's servant boy, John Birchall, a 15, 16-year-old boy, had, uh, let me just get this out of here. He'd shown up for work that morning, and his first job, he came into the basement stairs where cook Hannah Kahn was already you know, lighting up the grates and whatever and, and cooking. Um, a woman named Emma Cunningham was up on the third floor in her bedroom, and her daughters were there, and they were actually already up, and they were about to have breakfast. And uh, John came in, uh, and his first job was to get uh, scuttles of coal to bring up to all the various bedrooms in the building and put fires in the coal grates. And he went about his business, went up to the second floor with his scuttle, and um, something was uh, a little bit uh, amiss on the second floor. The second floor was where Harvey Burdell had his dental operatory, and he also uh, had his bedroom in the house. Now, 31 Bond Street, the house you saw before, is long gone, demolished around 1905. But by luck, 26 Bond Street is directly across the street and is extant. It still stands, and as you can see, from the detailing and the windows and all that sort of thing. It's a clone. I got into this building uh, by happenstance because it was listed in the window of a real estate broker's office up on the Upper East Side where my wife and I live. I was walking by one day and I saw uh, an ad for a building for sale, an investment. And I took one look at this address and I was already deep into the research of this project and I said, I'm going in. And I called up since I was in the real estate business before and a lawyer or whatever, and I said I want to buy the building or whatever, and in I went. And here you see an interior shot of 26 Bond. Mm -hmm. This is the stairway in 26 Bond, probably identical to the stairway in 31 Bond that John Birchall, the servant boy, went up with his scuttle of coal. He goes up to the second floor, he tries the door, Something's amiss. The key is on the outside of the door frame of the dental operatory. Normally, it would have been locked and fine. He jiggles the door. The door swings open a little bit, and there is a flood of blood on the floor, and there's his employer lying on the floor. He's got blue veins standing out all over his neck. There's a garrote lying loose. A ligature has been tightened around his neck. The boy doesn't even stop to count the number of puncture wounds in the body. He screams and runs out, tells the cook. They run upstairs, they run and get the police. Harvey Bedell is very, very dead. I'm gonna read you just a little bit of the account from the New York Herald from the next morning's paper. Because I find these, uh, the contemporary journalism as good as anything when you're, when you're uh, 
doing research. Uh, newspaper reporters in those days, I think, wrote much more vividly than they do today, albeit it's a little stilted. The condition of the room wherein the bloody scene was enacted bore evident traces of a long and desperate struggle having been made by the deceased ere he yielded to the knife of the assassin. Mind you, this is a news report on the front page of the paper. It's not some magazine article written two months thereafter. The walls were smeared with gore, while the entire floor of the neighborhood of the spot where the body was found was one sea of blood, the mutilated condition of the body, and the number of wounds upon the corpse would lead one to think that there must have been more than one hand in the horrid butchery. Twice the steel had pierced the heart, twice the lungs had been reached with the deadly point of the stiletto, while the jugular vein and the carotid artery were both severed and the life's blood oozed from the gaping wounds. Any one of the six wounds alluded to would have been sufficient to cause almost instant death. So we were led to infer that the foul deed was the work of more persons than one. The police were summoned from the Mercer Street uh, precinct, from the uh, 15th precinct at that time, and ran over and coroner Edward Downs Connery, uh, a Tammany appointee, was uh, summoned to the site also. Uh, coroner Connery, uh, had only one qualification for his job that he'd been appointed to, and that was he'd been a uh, theater critic for the New York Herald in years past, but being a good party member and a good Tammany devotee, this, this was his job. He convened a coroner's inquest that very afternoon and then started a two-week-long, what really amounted to a circus, uh, in, in 31 Bond Street, uh, the ground floor parlor, was converted to an inquest room. The dentistry chair, the patient's chair from the second floor was carted downstairs and that became the witness stand and a parade of witnesses were brought forth to testify. Emma Cunningham, who was the landlady of the premises, was instantly suspected in this murder. She was a uh, well-known figure in the neighborhood and she had been sexually involved with Harvey Riddell for quite some time although they were long on the outs by this time. She and her five children lived in the house and she operated a business there. In the middle of the 19th century, single so-called gentlemen like Harvey Burdell who owned their own homes had no use for the living room, for the kitchen, for the living quarters of the house. They frequently ate at the fancy hotels in the neighborhood and uh, used their homes as a real estate investment and would rent them out en masse other than their own rooms to uh, one or more landladies who would operate a business there. And Burdell had done so ever since he bought the house in 1852 or 1853. Emma Cunningham was the second landlady in the premises, but the way in which she took over the lease was hardly arm's length. Bond Street itself, and let me put another slide up on the screen here. Sure, I, if you can hear me. Yeah, well, that's for the video thing. It's for the video. Let me just give it a second. Sorry? Okay. If you want, maybe if you could slide him forward a little bit. And you can I'll talk loud. Is this better for people to hear now? Thank you. I'm sorry. I apologize. This, this is a stereo card. It's a shot, not really 1857, a few years later, probably 1860, 1861, from the New York Public Library stereo card collection. And this is the Bond Street neighborhood. You are looking north on Broadway, and you're looking at the Metropolitan Hotel here. And this is literally what Harvey Burdell saw when he went out of his house on any given morning. You have horse-drawn omnibuses there, a great deal of mud in the street, a great deal of horse manure, all of the fanciest hotels, 
all of the fanciest retail emporia, Lord and Taylor, uh, Tiffany's, uh, all the fanciest restaurants like Delmonico. This was the center of New York City in 1857. Bond Street was the place he came to wine, to dine, also to whore around. If you were a visiting businessman, you went over to Green Street, to Mercer Street, to the bordellos, etc., that were very, very common over there. It was the center of the entertainment venues, the so-called legitimate entertainment venues in mid-century New York also, from Canal, all the street, all the way up to Union Square. Laura Keene's Theater was there, Wallach's Theater there, Christie and Wood's Minstrel Hall was there, Wood being the brother of Mayor Fernando Wood. So this was really the center of, uh, it would be the Plaza District of New York City today in, in one sense or another. Bond Street had not always been a commercial area though. Bond is uh, just a few blocks uh, south of Astor Place, two or three. Uh, Bond Street was built up in the 1820s as a luxury, luxury street of private homes. The Lorillards lived there, the Skirmerhorns lived there, uh, the Cheese Bros of Cheese Bro Ponds lived there, Roosevelt's, this was a fancy place until about the early 1840, or the late 1840s, excuse me, when the commercial development of Broadway in the immediate vicinity began to take off and fancy people moved up to Union Square and to Gramercy Park. In those years, in the very late 1840s and the early 1850s, physicians began to move into Bond Street and live and practice both medicine and dentistry on Bond Street, and Harvey Riddell was one of them. There were also upper middle class boarding houses there in profusion, and that's how it came to be that uh, people like Burdell were able to operate their businesses and make a real estate investment in the area. Who was this guy, Harvey Burdell, and how did he get to New York? Burdell, as I mentioned, was a single man, one of five brothers, uh, born and raised, at least for a while, in upstate New York in Sackett's Harbor on one of the Great Lakes. Uh, unfortunately, when he was a young man, his father died, left his mother a widow with five children, no way to support them, and she did what Emma Cunningham tried to do in similar circumstances some 30 or so years later. She had to find a new husband and find one quick, and she did, a local farmer named Lehman. Unfortunately, Mr. Lehman did not want any of Polly Burdell's first bunch of children in his home, and he only made that clear after they were married. So Harvey and his four brothers were thrown out, Harvey being about 11 years old, and something tells me that it had something to do with Harvey's feelings towards women in the future. Harvey uh, educated himself after that, took a year or two of middle school, became a newspaper a, com a typesetter, a compositor, a newspaper reporter, and even owned a, uh, uh, a newspaper in Oswego, New York, for a year or two. And then followed his brother, John Burdell, his older brother, John Burdell, down to Philadelphia to get some sort of medical slash dental training at Jefferson Medical College, or so he claimed, uh, per, local, per newspaper reports that were published after his death. I went down to Philadelphia to try to find out if any of this was true, whether he had a medical degree, whether he'd gone to Jefferson Medical College. I couldn't find a single piece of evidence in the uh, Jefferson Medical College records that Harvey or his brother even attended the school, much less graduated, but people then as now tended to improve upon the truth, and you didn't need to have your credentials vetted that thoroughly in order to be admitted to medical societies and et cetera. Harvey also followed John to New, to New York City in the very early 1830s, and they entered into a dental practice together on Chambers Street, right where the old New York Sun building still sits, which A.T. Stewart had built as his department store on the, what, the northeast corner of Chambers and Broadway. They practiced for a few years, and then unfortunately, Harvey's older brother was brutally taken advantage of by an apprentice named Thomas Gunning, and Thomas stole John Burdell's clients, and they stole his wife. John's marriage fell apart, and Harvey and one of his other brothers 
swooped in and, and started to display some of the behavior that Harvey also show, showed towards Emma Cunningham later. There was a whole fratricidal war broke out, unspeakable consequences, and the Burdell brothers split apart, and John died in 1850. Um, a bit about Emma Hempstead, Cunningham, Burdell's personal history and how she got to 31 Bond Street. Emma is the, was the oldest of three daughters of a rope maker, a Wesleyan Methodist named Christopher Hempstead Sr., who lived uh, first in Lower Manhattan in Corlears Hook, where all of the shipyards were in the late, eight, in the, in the late part of the second de decade of the 19th century and on into the 1820s. Christopher Hempstead and his wife Sarah and their, three, and, and their eldest daughter moved to uh, what we call Dumbo now in Brooklyn, in downtown Front Street, Brooklyn, the Sand Street area, around 1822, where Emma's two younger sisters were born. Christopher Hempstead was a devout, and his wife were devout Wesleyan Methodists. No drinking, no dancing, no touching, no singing, no nothing. And you go to church and you're a class member, very, very observant people. You tithe and you more than tithe. Um, Emma Hempstead was not, as far as I can tell, particularly happy with this lifestyle. And in downtown Brooklyn in those days, it was already a very diverse place. There were many uh, young girls, her age as a young teenager. She saw these girls out there in their finery on Sundays and getting to go to the local department stores and getting to go to tea dances and et cetera, et cetera. And, and she really didn't want, as far as I can tell, to marry one of these eligible young Wesleyan Methodist men who were rather doer and rather sour and rather um, strict with their wives. And she kept her eyes open. And uh, down on Front Street, there was also a distillery owned by a man named William Cunningham, who was a Scotsman, a Presbyterian. And although he was a religious Presbyterian, the Presbyterians had no problem with the manufacture of what some people referred to as liquid death in those days. You could manufacture it and you could sell it, maybe even drink a little bit of it. And the Wesleyans would have no part of it. But young Emma Cunningham caught the eye of, William, uh, excuse me, young Emma Hempstead caught the eye of William Cunningham's eldest son, George D. Cunningham, who was 20 years Emma's senior. They undoubtedly knew each other from the street. Emma's grandfather, Nathaniel Hempstead, had a rope making shop also down on the waterfront there. And uh, they're just a block away. I mean, Brooklyn wasn't a huge place there. And people recognized each other on the street. And they undoubtedly became acquainted that way. Emma was looking for a way out of Wallabout, the Wallabout neighborhood. And she found it with George Cunningham. And he married her uh, in approximately 1839. And they began to have children. George was the scion of the Cunningham distillery fortune. He became an older man, and he did pretty well with his father's distillery business for a while. They even did well enough to, uh, to, to rise to the level that Emma had aspired to. They moved to Manhattan, and not just to Manhattan, but to Irving Place, just south of Gramercy Park in 1846 to a private home. This was the ne plus of Manhattan neighborhoods in that day, and they lived in this fancy home right below the square for just about a year. But unfortunately, uh, George Cunningham's business acumen uh, was, was not uh, as good as it might have been. And he started to fail through a series of poor partnerships and, and uh, unwise investments. And within a year, they had to leave Irving Place. And they moved back to Brooklyn to a series of ever more modest dwellings. And it came, came the gold rush. They were in very desperate financial straits. They had five children by this time. Uh, George's business was failing. It failed so badly that the part of it that he held in trust for his brother and two sisters was wiped out, and they were left ashamed. Many people think of the gold rush in this country as something that lower class Americans participated in. All these guys with their saddlebags went out west and sought their fortune. They didn't have a dime in their pockets and blah, blah, blah. It's not true. Approximately 70,000 men from the East went out to California over the course of the gold rush. The vast majority of, vast majority of them were middle class people. 
George Cunningham had one more shot left, and although he could hardly be called middle class anymore, he took his shot 